Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you, God, that you're able to speak to us every time we open this book. God, you have a new revelation for our spirits. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, just uh, starting off, we know the Bible. How many know the Bible? The Bible is basically um, made up of two testaments, as you know. The first 39 books of the Bible is we call the Old Testament, and then we have the New Testament, which is the remainder of the books of the Bible. And um, they're called the Old and the New Testament. And we don't really stop to think about what that actually means, but um, a testament actually is another word for covenant. And so we have the old covenant, we have the new covenant, and um, the word covenant actually comes from the, the verb meaning to cut, all right? Which is actually talking about, suggesting that an incision is cut from which blood will flow out of. All right? And the word, the word covenant is actually the strongest word in, in legal terms as far as a lawyer is concerned. They use this word to bind two parties to fulfill the obligations of an agreement. And so a covenant is very important. And that's why God, our God, is a covenant-keeping God. Amen? That's why marriage is so important. God wants us, because he's a covenant, he enters into relationship and he binds us into covenant relationship. He wants us not to just shack up like the world does. Amen? We have to say, listen, if, if, you're not, if you're not married, if you don't put a ring on that person's finger, get out of the house, right? you got to be a covenant-keeping person because God is. And that's why it's sinful because you're, you're taking something that's not yours because you're not in relationship, okay? And that's just free. I don't know who that's for, but it just came out. And so, so we need to understand that covenant is important. And, and if we understand that... Satan, in the beginning, he actually, he stole the human race from God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. And the next verse says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for the day that you eat of it you shall not die. And I want to say this, is that God is not a God that he should lie. Like men lie, we, th we let things come out of our mouth sometimes, right? And then we don't fulfill it. But there's a spiritual law here. The soul that sins shall die. And God says, the day you eat of the fruit, you will die. And if you go back in, into history, you'll see that Lucifer was an angel. And he was cast out from heaven because he allowed pride in his heart. How many remember last week's message? Right? So in order to uh, make space for grace, we've got to drive pride aside. Why? Because pride is what turned an angel into an archangel. What can it do an angel to a devil, what can it do for us, right? It can make us a bad thing. So we've got to deal with pride in our hearts. So Satan wanted to steal the human race from God. And God had said in his word, the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. All right? And so God gave man authority over the earth, just like he had authority in heaven. And see, God was not trying to give men, uh, he didn't create us just to control us. Did you know that? The Bible said God created us for fellowship. God created men and women so we could have fellowship. He would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden, right? And they had relationship with one another. But it was sin that separated them from their father, from God. And so God wanted them to have authority. But Satan usurped man's authority and seized control of the earth. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, we see that it says this. Those whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. And so people who aren't saved, their eyes are blinded by the God of this world, who is Satan. Amen. You know, do you ever remember those old movies? I can't think of the names, but there's certain movies out there where guys would get together and they have these hot rods and they would race. And what would be racing for pink slips, right? Well, if I can beat your car, you can have my pink slip. Right? Or I get your pink slip and vice versa. And the person that wins, right, comes back and goes, give me the pink slip. And they got another car, right? And see, see, the devil knew that God operated by laws. He operated by his own laws. The soul that sins shall die. So he, he realized, listen, I have to go through legal entrance and I, I want to I wanna get the pink slip back from man. So the earth that was created for men and women is now going to be under his control, Right? And that's why we have to be adopted back into the family of God, because we've been cut off from God. Satan has rulership over the earth. So people say, well, well, if there's a God, why do bad things happen in the earth? Well, because Satan is a God of this world, and we live in a fallen world. Good news, you can be redeemed and plucked out of this world, not literally, but out of this world system, 
be born again and, be, and live by another set of laws, the law of the kingdom. Amen? And so Satan understands this. And so you don't have to teach people to fear or to lie. They just naturally do it. You don't have to teach people that. You don't have to teach people to fight or quarrel. How many here have kids, right? You do not have to work at, with your kids and say, okay, Johnny, when I ask you to do something, you have to say no. You never have to do that. You have to work with them and say no. You have to say yes and thank you very much. You have to use manners. You need to be polite. You know, and, you know, we were doing the street sale the other day, and I can't tell you, almost every parent would say to their kid when we give them a freezy, say thank you. And they'd be like running up, no, no, to come back, say thank you. Thank you. And they'd run back to the jumping castle, right? Because you have to, you have to, you have to teach people how to walk in goodness, because naturally we're just selfish. Amen? And if you have kids, you know you have to work at teaching them good things, because naturally when, when the devil took the ownership, his nature got impregnated into the hearts of men. It's called the sin nature. So we have this natural act in us. We naturally go towards evil. And God wanted to redeem us from that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 says this. In which you once walked. He's talking to the church of Ephesus who are now born again. He says, you used to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Are you a son of disobedience? Let me see your hand. Nobody here? Good. So, so you're no longer to walk according to the course of this world. You're supposed to walk by the Spirit. Amen? So God created man to rule and to reign, and this was a mystery that was hidden in God. God and man's fellowship was broken. God set a plan in place, in place to restore the fellowship with mankind. He wanted to restore and bring redemption. Do you know what redemption means? Redemption means to buy back and the thing in, in the Bible, and this is why Jews and people of other faith have a real problem going through the Old Testament, because they say it's, it's really not clear. It doesn't talk about who the Messiah is or how God's going to redeem. Uh, but God couldn't make it super clear, because if he did, the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians 2.8, show me another verse here, which none of the rulers of this age, speaking of the embodied, disembodied spirits being the, the fallen angels. How many believe in demons here? Let me see your hands. Okay. All right. The demons, if they would have knew, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They wouldn't have. So it, that's why when Jesus taught the Gospels, he always spoke in parables. He wasn't trying to confuse the masses. He wanted to keep the devil out of the loop. And so every time he gave a parable, he said, well, the kingdom of God is like that. And the devil's sitting there, hmm, what's he, what's he trying to get there? And he's talking to his, his fallen angel buddies and saying, I, I think he's, they, Jesus is up to something, but I can't figure it out. Can you guys? Well, we don't know. And, and Jesus is speaking in parables. And then he says to his disciples, the Father's opening your ears to hear. You can only know by the Spirit. And that's why people who aren't saved can read the Gospels and say it makes absolutely no sense. But the moment they say a prayer, like Stephen's buddy, and ask Jesus to come into their heart, they open their Bible like, wow, I understand it for the first time. Why? Because the author of the book moved in. And could you imagine sitting down with an author and having him explain everything in the book? That's what happens when the Spirit of God comes in. He explains to you, this is what I meant when I said this. Amen? And so, so we have the author living in us. And so God wanted to produce uh, a relationship um, or restore a relationship with people. And so there's two covenants. One covenant was between God and Abraham. And the second covenant was between Jesus and God, the Father. Two covenants. The Old Testament is all about the covenant with Abraham. The New Testament is a covenant with God. And see, Abraham, you guys know Abraham, he didn't understand that God needed to retrieve his legal right to man from Satan. Abraham did not know this. He did not know that God needed a man to covenant with who would obey him at any cost, who would take him at his word, and who would believe him. And this is what he found in Abraham. He found a man that said, God, I'm going to take you at your word, I'm going to believe you at any cost, and, and I'm going to believe in you. And through that man, God would bring a nation and through that nation, a family, through that family, he would choose a woman to bring forth a redeemer for mankind, the Messiah. Isn't that good? Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 5 says this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, 
to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. And you know what's amazing? And you guys know this. If you read through the New Testament, you see everything is about fellowship, right? You want to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You want to have fellowship with Jesus. You want to have fellowship with the Father. And it's all made accessible by, by God. And what the devil wants to do is he wants us to become religious. And it just got, well, it's all about rules and regulations. Well, listen, there are rules and regulations, but they become a natural outflow of the Spirit of grace. And so we can get into our, our systems and our structures spiritually, and we can get away from the relationship that God wants us to have so we can be free and we can lock, walk in victory. And that's what God wants to do uh, through re- relationship. And he does that through this thing called blood covenant. Blood covenant is the oldest covenant right known in human history. It is practiced in many parts of the world today. It's practiced by primitive people. It's practiced by, it's common among the uh, American Indian tribes, or uh, what's the proper political term there? Not Indian. Uh, you can't say indigenous anymore? Okay. All right. The indigenous people, thank you very much. Okay. And, and it's incorporated in witchcraft and different things like that. And, and a blood covenant is actually, uh, there's nothing more sacred than that. A blood covenant is very sacred. Um, and it's in partnership. It's to ensure that neither party will take advantage of the other between friends. It's a symbol of love, devotion, and loyalty. And so there was a guy, how many heard of David Livingston? And he was a missionary that went to Africa, and he was reaching the African people f- with the gospel. And so there was a man named Stanley. He said, I'm going to go find Livingston. i got to get into Africa. So he, back in the day, they didn't have, you know, it was hard to get around. So he got into Africa, and he was going through, uh, I forget which province, but he was going through, and he, he ran into this certain tribe, and there was a leader, and they would not let Stanley by. He said, you're not going into Africa. This is where it stops. And so St- Stanley says to his, his interpreter, what do we do? Because we need to get in. We've got to find David, and God's got a mission for us. We've got to move on. And so um, Stanley's interpreter said, you need to cut a covenant with the chief. What do you mean cut a covenant? What do you, what do you mean? He says, well, this is what we're going to do. So both the chief and Stanley have to find a substitute. So the chief has a representative, and Stanley has a representative, which is this his interpreter. And they came before their priest of this religion, whatever it was, and uh, they made a cut, and they put their arms together, and they let their blood drink, drip into a, um, into a cup. Okay, I don't, I'm not recommending you do this because it's not good. But, uh, <clears throat> and then the cup is drunk by the two men, therefore uniting the two of them. And after drinking the wine, they rub gunpowder in the wound to leave a mark like a tattoo. So say, listen, I'm a covenant man. You see the tattoo? I'm a covenant man. I belong to that person. I represent that person. He represents me. He protects me. That's what marriage is. This is a covenant. This is a sign of a covenant. I'm a covenant man. So if a woman looks at me, I say, I'm married, right? This is a covenant, sign of a covenant. And so a covenant is very important. And so then the priest stood forward and pronounced wonderful blessings over Stanley. and, and, And they began to pronounce the curses that would follow if Stanley broke the covenant. And then again, Stanley's interpreter did the same. And so a blood covenant is usually exchanging a gift, which symbolizes that everything is mine, now is yours, and everything that yours is mine. And it's usually your most prized possession that you would exchange. And so Stanley had a problem with ulcers, and so he, he went everywhere with a goat. He had this little goat that he took everywhere with him, and it, because he would drink the goat milk, and it, it would help his ulcer and calm the pain. And so, of course, um, the... Uh, the chief goes, I want your goat. Stanley's like, man, that's my goat. I can't give you my goat. What am I going to drink, right? I can't drink cow's milk. I got an ulcer. He's, so the interpreter said, listen, if he wants the goat, give him the goat. So he goes, okay, fine, take the goat. Gives him the goat. And then um, the chief gave him a seven-foot copper spear with a big coil on it. So Stanley's like, what am I do with this big stick? Great, I lost my goat. I got a stick. So um, Stanley starts walking, and he's going from that tribe he leaves, and he's moving into the next tribe. And as he's coming to the village, everybody starts bowing down before him. And he says to his interpreter, why are people bowing down to me? He said, because you've got a seven coil. You've got this stick, which represents the authority of the head chief. And if you have that, then you have authority. 
And he walked into the village and said, what, what do you want? And Stanley says, I want a goat. <laughs> and they gave, him, they gave him a whole herd of goats. He had so many goats, he could drink milk till the cows came home, right? He had it. Um, but, but he had respect from the other tri tribes. They bowed down to him. Why? Because of the spear. And the whole continent of Africa was open to this man because he had this spear with him because he was in covenant with someone who was greater than him. And that's what happens with us as believers. We're in covenant with someone who's greater than us. And because we're in covenant with God, his authority is with us. And wherever we walk, wherever we set our foot, that's our ground to take if we'd only believe it. Amen? He's given us his authority. What do we give him? We give him our goat nature. Like, stand here, take my goat, Jesus, there you go. Bah. And what does he do? He gives us the rod of his authority. He gives us his name. He gives us his, his blood. He gives us his authority in the earth so we can walk as overcomers. I mean, what an awesome thing that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth, and he gives it to us, and he says, it's my name and it's yours, and if you pray believing, you shall receive. That's an awesome promise. God is so faithful. And so God, God knows because he's a covenant God, he's going to take the first step uh, with Abraham, which we read about in Genesis chapter 17, uh, verse 1 to 8. Let's read that. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I'm the almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make a covenant between me and you, and you will multiply, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And then Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. All right, which we are the children of Abraham, in a sense. Move on. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but the name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make the nations for you. Sorry, make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to uh, be God to you and your descendants after you. Okay? And I also will give to you and your descendants after you a land in which you are a stranger in the land of Canaan. As an everlasting possession, I will be their God. And so this is the first covenant that we read about that Abraham um, enters into. And if, if you read into it, you'll see that God said you need to have these certain animals and we're going to cut them in half and they were, set, they were set apart. How many remember the story? We can't get into it for time's sake. But it got really dark and Abraham walked down and there was like a furnace appeared and God met him in the middle and he passed out and it was really cool and you got to read it yourself. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's really good. It was a covenant. There was blood. There was commitment. There was exchanging of gifts and promises and, and you guys got to do it. It's good. I think it's Genesis 17. Um, well, you'll have to look it up yourself because I don't have the notes. But... Abraham passed the supreme test. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, it says this. Genesis 22, verse 2. And he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain of which I shall tell you. Now, you've got to understand this. God is kind of like, um, it's kind of like the story of Stanley, right? Give me your goat, the chief says. That's the most important thing to you. It helps your ulcer. In the same way, he's saying to Abraham, he's saying, listen, give me the most prized possession, the thing you've been waiting 40 years for. You've been waiting for this, this boy to be born, and I've given him to you, so now I want him back. And so he's saying, I want your most valuable possession. Isn't that amazing? And Abraham obeyed God. Now, God didn't want to kill his son. We know that. God was testing him. And as Abraham tied up his son on the altar, he was about to bring down the knife. And God said, stop. I have provided a sacrifice. And he looked, and what did he see in the bushes? A ram. Did he see a lamb? A ram is a father. A lamb is a son. And the father says, I'm going to sacrifice myself. I will send my son the lamb. Isn't that awesome? And so, so God says, you, you know, you give me your best and I'll give you my best. And he was given a prophetic picture of Jesus who was going to come as a sacrifice. All right. God is good. I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to move through some of these scriptures here. Um, Let's go to, I just want to go to a couple of scriptures here I want to talk about here for a second. It's in Genesis somewhere, so. Um, 
And it's about Abel. So let's go see if we can find it because I don't have the verse here. It's in Genesis chapter 2, I think. Life in the Garden. Okay, so it's, Gen uh, it's Genesis chapter 4. Okay, we're going to start in verse 2. And um, you got the verse up there, Genesis 2? Genesis 4, verse 2. And this is talking about Eve. Eve bore again, and this time she had a brother, Abel. She had Cain and Abel, basically. Now, Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Say, Abel was a keeper of the sheep. So we know that. What is he taking care of? He's got sheep, right? And um, Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel brought of the first fruits of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. All right. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, you'll be accepted. And if you don't do well, sin lies at the door and its desires for you, but you shall rule over it. And now Cain talked, to his, talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for him? Look what it says here. And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Did you know that blood has a voice? And Cain's blood, because Abel killed his brother, was crying out vengeance. vengeance. And God in the spirit realm was hearing the blood. And because the soul that sins shall die. You see, what happened here was God provided a way. He said, listen. He found Adam and Eve in the garden after they had sinned. They put little fig, fig leaves on them and they were hiding in the bushes. And God said, you know what? You can't hide your nakedness. You can't take care of your own problem. The soul that sins shall die. There has to be a substitution for your sin, or you have to die yourself. And so he went and killed the lamb, and he, he covered them with tunics of skin. That's what God said. Gen he was the first fur coat, Genesis. It's in Genesis. And then Abel, uh, was he understood this, so he was bringing a sacrifice. He was bringing a lamb to be slaughtered. That was his sacrifice, and it was acceptable to God because it was a substitution lamb. But Cain said, now, I want to do it my own way. I'm going to just bring offerings. I'm going to bring fruit and vegetables. And God said, listen, this is not acceptable. It has to be blood. It has to be a blood sacrifice. It has to atone for your sin. And what he should have did, Cain should have had, maybe it was pride, but maybe he should have went to his brother and said, here, I'm going to give you three wheelbarrows of corn and turnips, and, I, and, and you give me a lamb. And he should have bought a lamb and did it God's way instead of his own way. And see, this is the problem today with religion, is people think, well, if I pray enough, or if I do enough good works, if I walk little people, ladies across the street, if I do all these good things, then I'm going to be good enough, I'm going to get to heaven. No, you can't do it your way. You have to, there has to be a substitution lamb on your behalf. Amen? And we know who that lamb was. Who was it? Jesus Christ. 4,000 years later, once and for all, all right? So he, here, here's the thing, here's the thing. Abel's blood cries out vengeance before God. 4,000 years later, Jesus comes and dies, and let's see what Jesus' blood says. How many want to hear what it says? Jesus' blood cries mercy. Ven see, the vengeance is being called out from the blood of Cain, or Abel, sorry. But Jesus' blood on the cross was crying out mercy. Let's look what it says, Romans 5.19. We're going to read through a few verses. Romans 5.19. Jesus' blood cries mercy. We got it, Peter? Not Peter, Brian. We good? There we go. For as... As by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. So we're justified because of the blood of Jesus. Isn't that good news? The next one is we are redeemed. Ephesians 1 7. Ephesians 1 7. Bring that up. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We have redemption through his blood. Colossians 1.20, 
we have peace. Colossians 1.20. Let's bring that one up. And by him, to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. He made peace. All we have to do is accept him. Isn't that awesome? The next one here is Hebrews 13, verse 12. Hebrews 13, 12. It's coming. Hebrews 13, 12. Uh, 13, yeah, 12. Thank you for your patience. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Jesus' blood sanctifies us. You know, the Old Testament, the blood of, uh, uh, of bulls and lambs, that just basically covered, just washes your sin away. It redeems you. Isn't that awesome? He suffered outside the gate. And let's look at one more. Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought, who bought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, in whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Isn't that good? Every good work. He made us complete because of the blood of the Lamb. Say this with me. Say, Abel's blood cries, uh, cries vengeance, but Jesus' blood cries mercy. Amen. So, honey, do you think we can remember that song? Let's try it. We, I was thinking of the song. We, I don't know if we can remember it. It's called His Blood Cries Mercy, and my brother wrote it, so it's a good song, and we're going to attempt it. All right. I was looking for the words. Uh, Travis brother Nathan was writing this song, and it's a powerful song. We used to sing it in the prisons uh, way back before we had our children, and now I couldn't find the words. So I've been sitting trying to scramble and remember. So if we don't get it all right, maybe another time when we found, find the words, we'll do it all right. <laughs> and we asked Nathan yesterday if he could use it, and he said it was okay. And he said it would cost 500 bucks. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So we might have to, it's going to be almost a little bit of practice in front of you guys. Hope that's okay today. <laughs> All right. Jesus died upon the cross. It was no ordinary death. It was more than just a beating and the pain within his flesh. For he took all of our sins as he died for us that day. Though the people scorned and spat at him, he forgave them anyway. His blood cries mercy, mercy for us it cries. Holy is the one who was slain to redeem us and restore us again. His blood cries mercy again and again. His blood cries mercy. Mercy for us in Christ, holy is the one who was slain to redeem us and restore us again. His blood cries mercy again and again. His blood will never lose its power. It will never fade away. For he offered it to God for you and me that day. The veil was torn away so we could run to the mercy seat. Let him take our sins away. Sing together. His blood cries mercy. Mercy for us in Christ. Holy is the one who was slain to redeem us. And restore us again. His blood cries mercy again and again. His blood cries mercy. Mercy for us in Christ. Holy is the one who was slain to redeem us and restore us again. His blood cries mercy again and again. His blood cries mercy. His blood cries mercy.
There's a few other verses, but I said to my wife last night, let's do the song, but we can't find the actual, the, the, sheet, or the, sheet, the sheet, so we don't know all the verses, but we'll learn it, and we'll maybe do it as a church. It'll be good. So I want to say this. It's important to understand this, and this is why it brings us back to grace, is because there's, we can't boast. We're not saved by our own works. We're saved because we accept Jesus as our blood atonement, our, how did I say it before? Substitutionary lamb. Amen? And people, if you have never received Jesus as your substitution lamb, that he died in your place, that you don't have to die and be separated from God, you need to say, Lord, I receive you as my substitution lamb. You died in my place, and I receive that by faith. And that's where it begins. Amen?